I'm Loki Karuna, and this is Triloquy. Greetings. Oh, well, I think it goes without saying that the nation is feeling away right now, as you may be feeling away right now. Some folks are very happy for some reason, and others are very disappointed. I was pretty intentional about not voicing much of an opinion during this election cycle, mainly because I feel like y'all should know where I stand at this point, considering the degree to which I feel like we need to decolonize not only so-called classical music, but our entire society. I don't think that the United States government politics in America, I don't think there is a extreme left. I barely believe there's a left. I feel like Democrats are very moderate. And honestly, when people think about this moment of uh, Kamala Harris's defeat, I'm thinking about how neoliberalism has really gotten in the way. There are many factors, including racism, uh, misogyny, uh, so so many issues to be unpacked and to be connected to this moment in history. And among them, I include the issue of there not really being a place for so many people to vote. Uh, looking at the numbers, it looks like people who voted for a third party, if they had all jumped on board with Kamala, wouldn't really have made a difference. But there are millions of people who didn't vote and just don't vote. If you look at the U.S. population and the number of votes that were tallied, it's clear that there are communities of people who for some reason just don't feel connected to. And based on the conversations I have on the ground, including my own personal politics, I consider neoliberalism that thing that's in the way. Now, that isn't to say that I didn't vote. I was definitely at the polls early. I went uh, actually Sunday uh, before the election day on Tuesday. But here we are, democracy at work. The people have spoken. Um, what I think bothers me a little bit more even than the outcome is all of the lack of time that just just the how rushed we've been through processing this moment in history you know as workers uh we are just taught to keep moving forward we've had no time to really process what's happening and to think about what project 2025 might mean to us what what's going on for immigrants, what's going on for black folks, for women. You know, it's expected of us to pick up our proverbial plow and just keep going, despite the fact that many folks have no idea what their futures will look like. Many women fear for their futures. There are countless immigrants who don't know what's coming next for them. And, you know, black folks across the country are getting text messages saying that we need to get ready to go back to the plantation. For goodness sake, so much is happening. I'm going to tell you all right now, I'm going to be a very uh, disrespectful and uh, unruly slave if <laughs> if that's going to be a thing, not to make light of, or make a joke around a very si serious situation. But we're, we're headed in a direction. And as a people, as a working class, we need to figure out how to come together and uh and turn this ship around between now and 2028, I suppose. Um, QEP Newton is someone I've been reading a lot of lately. He was an activist who far, fought hard for workers in addition to rights for black folks. And I'm going to read a bit from his autobiography in today's Triloquy. Um, but for right now, something much lighter from Washington. How about that? I'm very excited to feature Jennifer Coe in this opus of Triloquy. She's a world-renowned violinist. She's a new music advocate, big thinker, progressive thinker, and she's the current artistic director of the Kennedy Center's Fortas Chamber Music Concerts. The Kennedy Center does a lot of work to make sure that their programming connects with community in some way, and Jennifer is the latest person they've brought in to curate and produce some of their upcoming programming. Coming up later this month is Jenny's Sounds of Us Music Festival, which we talk about in our uh, dialogue, and it's going to highlight some of the uh, most innovative music making outside of what and outside of who is typically engaged in a space like the Kennedy Center. I'll have a link in the description with more information if you're in the D.C. area this month or if you're interested in traveling there. I hope you all will consider going out to support this effort by Jenny Co. Uh, we also talk about several other things and uh, I'll just go ahead and let us get into it to get us into my chat with Jenny. I wanted to share a little music from the album that first put her on my radar as a radio host. This was probably way back in my Knoxville days as a radio host when I first saw the name Jennifer Coe on an album, listened to some of the music and immediately 
Fell in Love. So here's one of those tracks. Jenny Co is featured here with violinist Jaime Laredo in a work by one of my favorite composers, the one and only Philip Glass. So this tune is called Echorus, a play on the word echo and the idea of echoes. Hope you all enjoyed this excerpt, this performance by Jenny Co and Jaime Laredo to get us into my chat with Jenny. Um, I, what I would say is that I think the inclusion of stories other than the ones we've heard for a long time, my question is, is that actually a risk? And if it is a risk to listen to stories other than our own, why does it feel risky? Is it risky because it's a different narrative? Is it risky? So I th- I think that's more a question um, for me. Uh, I think the other I think the other interesting thing to me is that I think it, a lot of the projects I do, for example, engage with utilize older forms, whether it's concerto, sonata, or what we might think is violin, piano, what we might conceive as being within the Western canon as being a, you know, a sonata or chamber music, all of those different things. Um, And sometimes I feel that it's so hard to talk about these things, actually. I just gave a talk with um, a a kind of presentation and concert with Devon and we had, uh, sorry, Devon Tynes, and we had worked on this and created this piece uh, with Ken Weno and this amazing uh, composer and um, also the dramaturg, uh, Kia Nam. And it was so difficult to describe the project uh, because it was about our shared experiences as people of color within the classical music world. Um, it was about our kind of maternal and familial lineage and experience um, that I think resonate within us for generations, actually. Um, And so whenever we were asked to categorize it, or it it was even difficult to apply for grants uh, because, you know, people would ask, oh, is is this a bass and baritone? bass baritone recital with violin and some like multimedia screen um or else is this like a, you know a project with like lighting or is this and of course it was all of these things is it opera is it you know and so there was a part of me that i've been thinking maybe when we tell stories that are outside of kind of the normal stories that have been told, maybe we actually need new forms as well. Mm. Of course, uh, of course, you know, a lot of my projects are, do engage with, with older pre-existing forms because I feel like that's interesting to me because I see how um, composers evolve I, and, and kind of blow the forms out of the water. I feel like for myself personally, um, the reason I love doing the six sonatas and partitas of Bach all as, as one is because not only do I see it as kind of a personal musical journey, a journal of his life, um, but also that you can hear the first sonata and partita and he's working within um, the exact form that had existed before. And then you see this kind of evolution and heartbeat where he just 
you know, kind of blows the, you know, we have four movements in um, Sonata. Uh, previous, previously, you know, partitas are just parts, so there's dance movements. But then by the second partita, he's just blown the entire thing out of the water with the Chacon being 50%. Even with the second Sonata, the fugue is 50% longer than the previous um, fugue. So that's what's interesting. How how do artists kind of evolve, dream, and create a new future? And so then that becomes translated into um, how do we how do we bring institutions and um, you know actually I have to say I think audiences are interested. So mm -hmm. you, you mentioned you know the word risk and and. It's it's difficult for me to um, hundred percent understand that to the degree that um, I do feel that there's a great deal of of desire and from human beings and society um, to have our experiences expressed, to have our voices heard, um, and so my question of Risk is also who's making the judgment of what is considered risky. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been interesting to me working at the, you know, working at the Kennedy Center is the first time I've ever worked within a larger institution. Um, I had started ARCO Collaborative, which was basically, you know, the mission is to highlight the voices of, of, um, people kind of unheard before and, and advocating for, for those artists, people of color, non-binary, female. Um, so my what's been interesting is, and that's, of course, artist-led, so in the sense that, okay, I really believe that this project's important. And everybody might say this is a terrible idea. How are we going to fund this? Um, but my kind of my, the way I've always operated is, well, and I think this is true about most minorities, actually, is if you're, if you've grown up and entered the business when you were not wanted in the field, mm. no is not really, <laughs> no is not exactly the thing, that's not what stops you. Because if no had stopped you before, you wouldn't be in the field. Right. And you certainly wouldn't be continuing to do um, things that kind of push up against um, uh, what had been there before, because in a weird, in a way, I feel like just our existence in the field is like an act of rebellion. Right. And if you can actually exist in the field as like a complex person, as a complex musician thinker that's an act of rebellion um so really most of the time my when people are when there's language around risk i think about historically how much funding was spent creating a series creating an institution to be directed toward, towards a very specific audience that has been directed with um, a very specific message that was, and do we agree with all, uh, you know, with all of the viewpoints and missions um, that, you know, if the institution is a hundred years old that we did at the beginning. Um, and as a result of that, you think, and and then it's like, so how much funding has gone into programming or into, you know, investing in artists of color and investing in new voices? Uh, so long story, you know, this is a very long <laughs> <laughs> answer to this very, <laughs> like, uh, so, anyway, but I guess... Um, so it, it, but it does go back to who's ac actually saying that this is risky mm -hmm. with the idea of historically, 
the institution has invested how much into what had existed before. And then if there is a grant of like, let's say $5,000, 25, let's, or within like a very large institution, which works with, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? investing a hundred thousand a lot, you know, especially when you're continuing the kind of uh, narrative that you've had for years and years. And I guess I don't mean even like 10 years. Uh, I, you know, this has been done historically for such a long time. Uh, yeah. So that's my very long answer to, is it, what do I say when people say it's a risk? Um, and then to kind of circle back to, to everything rises when you have a work that two artists have made, which is about, um, well, first of all, I've never seen the Korean American experience put mm -hmm. on a classical music stage. Um, I, I mean, there could be, but I do like do I go to a lot of concerts and shows and um, and I've certainly never heard um, the story of the Korean War told uh, on a stage in classical music, nor um, kind of this, the, I suppose, uh, I hate using the word trauma, but perhaps I should use the word impact. Mm -hmm. The impact that violence has been done to your parents, your grandparents, um, that travels within multiple generations. Um, you know, Korea was occupied uh, by Japan, then uh, it had uh, Independence Day on August 15, and then it went into a civil war. But then we also have to consider what has the West done to all of Asia right. in a certain period of time. And so how does that affect the immigrant story? How does that affect um, immigrants coming into the U.S.? as a result of, of their, their histories. And then finally, what Everything Rises is about, is about unity and the strength of our stories and our families and our family stories. Um, sometimes I call it, it's not actually entertainment sometimes. It's like confrontainment. Mm -hmm. And I... It was interesting because we did a run of Everything Rises at BAM. And the I think it was like the week afterwards, I played the Tchaikovsky concerto. And people were so happy. I think they actually like started clapping, like right after the first movement. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, if you're in the field and you want applause, if you want love, from an audience, if you want approval, then playing, you know, traditional war horses, it's like opium, but it's like opium for musicians. <laughs> you know, it's not opium for the masses, it's opium for artists, for musicians. Um, yeah. So, th but sometimes art it has to give voice to truth. And that's not always easy to hear. And that's not always easy to witness. Um, but there, you know, I think what, what is important that we do is, is to utilize art as a place to speak truth. You know, when you mentioned the Tchaikovsky, you make me think about uh, this implication. What, so you mentioned the Tchaikovsky and also uh, the conversation of what the West has done to Asia. I think that you know, I expand that oftentimes to think about what the West has done to this concept of classical music. Of course, we know that there's Indian classical music that has nothing to do with Bach and, and Beethoven, you know, of China, of the African continent. You know, th this phrase classical music um, has been colonized so much that it's difficult sometimes for people to hear that phrase and think 
uh, beyond the um, the opium composers that I think <laughs> you 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 mentioned there. Um, I wonder. I guess number one, what are your thoughts on um, taking that phrase classical music and disconnecting it from its sort of exclusive status as referring to Western European music? That, that's part A. And I think part B, how do you balance an engagement of the so-called canon versus innovation? You know, in, in my practice and my programming practice and in my activism, I've often said that we just need to take all of those so-called warhorse composers, put them on the shelf and actually center living composers because there certainly would not be a shortage of music to program and 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 to enjoy. I wonder how you um, engage those two things, the use of this phrase classical music and balancing uh, between innovation and um, an engagement of what many people are familiar with when they hear that phrase classical music. So one of the interesting things you're talking about living composers and kind of quote unquote um, standard um, war horses. And there's like, sometimes I feel like there's so much to, it's, I went to the public theater. They have like a series of, um, of like first nation native American playwrights that, um, that they commission every year. And I was thinking, and I went to a couple of them and I was thinking how much harder it is for minority groups, because you have to explain the entire history of your people, of the experience. And then you also have to put in this universal human experience, whereas we're used to, I mean, the majority, we're used to the majority story. Right. We, no, we all know we've been trained. We've been like told that this is great stuff, whether it's Shakespeare, whatever. And so that entire history <laughs> To, and context doesn't have to be um, made for every single show. So, so it's actually to me, even I like the admiration I have when I see artists doing work in which that history you're trying to create that history and context, and and then on top of that, you're trying to also communicate a very human story. It's it feels like. Um, I I admire people that do that because it takes such a commitment and it's so difficult. Um, what you mentioned about using utilizing or yeah, I think utilizing um the voices of the people that we live amongst. Um and and to actually make space for them and and listen to that. Uh, one of the things that I did during the pandemic was make this project called Alone Together. Why was Alone Together important? Yes, it was tiny bits of funding. Um, I could have made the decision to commission like two composers uh, for longer pieces, right? But then knowing as a freelancer, it's like, we always like cobble money together from like different sources, you know? Um, and that's why it was micro commissions, but why was it important? Not only the commission and hopefully exposure for the composers, it was, um, sync fees, sync fees. There's costs to sync fees. Mm -hmm. There are costs to renting music. Um, from living composers. And I actually found it interesting um, that there, there were, there was like this renaissance of Florence Price's music, which I thought, and I continue to think is a wonderful thing. However, my question still became, remain, why isn't there support for composers of color today? Mm -hmm. I was like, and actually it came down to the point where I was like, because there was so much, I think, also uh, publicity around and signaling around the programming of Florence Price. Um, and to some degree, I could say that I saw a lot of self-congratulations um, around that. But then for me, I'm, I was thinking, 
shouldn't there be support of the artists that are actually making things today? Right. Are, are, and because that means we're actually investing in artists um, for the future also to have voice, um, to have opportunity. Um, in my own experience, um, I would say that opportunity and and experience actually teaches you the most, um, even more. Of course, uh, I've learned so much in school, um, and I was really lucky to have these mentors that I actually continue to to play for and kind of study with way past school time. Um, but for me, what was mo like most important was working and performing with these artists. Because also in my familial line, there had been no musicians. Uh, so I was kind of taught just through observation how to actually even live as a musician, how to speak. So the kind of language in rehearsal. Um, and it was all through observation. Um, and of course, investment of time uh, from 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 these kind of mentors. Uh, but so, yes, I think that means in order to actually invest in the stories of people that have been excluded from the narrative, mm -hmm. of what we call classical Western music is that you actually have to um, give these experiences and leave space for people that have never, haven't had that. And I was thinking the other thing I was thinking, or the other thing I've been thinking of lately was through conversations with different colleagues that are also people of color. Um, and I was thinking, oh, there's not space to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. When you're a performer, um, and why is that important? Is it, it's, it's important generally in the art form. I think it's important generally in terms of for artists because I don't think that, uh, you know, we can be as creative as is necessary unless we have opportunity and naturally, out of all of those things, there will be things that don't work. However, there I've been to plenty of orchestral concerts where things have not worked. I've been at plenty of, of things that have not worked that have nothing to do with people of color. Mm -hmm. And so, but then I'm like, oh, but there's so much more forgiveness. There's so much more space um, to return. And I was thinking. I was thinking, oh, that needs for performers, even for composers, that we have to create more space. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because there has been such a history. I mean, just confronting it since when in 2020, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not that <laughs> it's four years later, you know, just making one program for a year, two programs, one week, one festival that really doesn't even counteract the one year, much less decades and decades of history. Right. Um, so that's been a lot of what I've been thinking about as well, how we leave space for experimentation, um, which naturally involves making you know, not everything being perfect, but I mean, honestly, I find it way more interesting to hear things and go to shows in which I can see that artists are thinking in a different way. And maybe the show totally fails, but that's way more, I, you know, a million times prefer to go to that show than to go through to, you know, a very good performance of repertoire that I've heard my entire life.
I mean, look, if it's exceptional and the most amazing thing ever, and I've had moments in my life when I've sat in an audience and it has been Beethoven, in which it was so extraordinary that I sat there thinking, I'm really lucky to be alive right now so that I can be present and I can be in this moment and experience this. Mm. However, that's maybe four times, five times in my life that I've sat in a hall and really felt that. Um, and counteract that maybe, or, or to balance that, I've probably been to at least a thousand concerts. Sure. Like sitting at, like in the audience, mm -hmm. not even me playing. And let me be generous. Let's say it's even 50 concerts, or let's say it's a hundred. Out of that balance, then I, you know, what I would like to see is, okay, uh, because I'm also, unlike the stereotype of the model minority, I'm not good at math. Okay, so if it's like, okay, I have to put it in large numbers. <laughs> if it's like a thousand concerts, and if like, uh, let's say it's, I'm being generous and it's a hundred, that's still 90, that means 900, oh, 90%. Right? Is that, right? That's right. Yep. <laughs> um, Ninety percent should have been new music. Right. <laughs> Is my feeling. I want to. Yeah. I, I want to talk about, um, you know, when you use the word experimentation, I think it's very important to note that your experimentation isn't just improvisation on the stage as a musician you know there's so much experimentation that goes into uh, developing relationships with collaborators curating and all of these different things you do i want to take that and uh, shift and talk a little bit about sounds of us that you're doing at uh, the, oh, yes. the, the kennedy center you know many people um and myself included i'll, I'll just say you know We've been extremely critical of arts institutions who are planning celebrations around the 250th anniversary of the United States, considering the country's history, uh, certainly as it applies to me as, you know, the descendant of enslaved Africans. There's so many people of color and maybe even some non-people of color who have really great reason to critique this idea of a celebration of America's birthday. I, I wonder how you're thinking about this upcoming 250th as it relates to your work with the Kennedy Center? Are you thinking of it as a celebration, as a time of mourning, and maybe something in between? Um, so one of the thinkers that I admire the most is Robin Kelly. Um, I started out, the historian Robin Kelly, I started out by reading his um, biography of Bolognius Monk. And it was just extraordinary to me to see how he truly integrated history, American history, um, and created all this context for this miracle to rise out of this world <laughs> um, into the mind and artist and singular musician that Thelonious Monk is. Um, and so I can't remember the title of the book anymore. I'm sorry. Um, but I remembered the phrase that he used. Um, and he's a historian, but primarily American historian. Mm -hmm. um, and he, the one line he used was, how do we dream ourselves out of this nightmare? Mm. And everybody should read Robin Kelly. <laughs> I love Robin. Um, and, and so Sounds of Us is about giving voice to artists to lead us out of this history. And what do they dream for the next 250 years of this country? And that's what this is. Um, that's what this festival is. It's marking 250 years of what had existed before. Um, but I've always believed in general anyhow um, that artists dream the future, that we can't make a better future unless we dream it mm -hmm. first. 
So it's important to give artists the space to do that and the funding. And I will include in this conversation that it's ARCA Collaborative that did all of the commissioning of this festival. ARCA Collaborative, which is my nonprofit that I started, we work on five figures a year until it like will blow it up or the budget kind of blows up for projects that go to artists. Mm -hmm. So the funding really is going to artists. Um, But I guess that that's, that's, um, that's where I will end that conversation (laughs) in that place. Um, and I guess the other thing I will say is that, um, I'm used to, to existing in a space and I think people of color are used to existing in, in spaces where they're not wanted or their viewpoints or their experiences are not valued. Um, aside from not being heard, (laughs) but if they are heard. Um, And so, of course, there can be all of this kind of signaling and messaging. Uh, I think, you know, it's great that I'm the first Asian to be heading an artistic position at Kennedy Center. And, but I think the truth actually of commitment actually comes through, I will say now being an institution through funding, Mm. there's not, and I am very stubborn (laughs) and I have existed in this field for a while and I have done a lot of projects for a long time. And fortunately, unfortunately, it's it's been my experience for every single project that I've ever done. I can say this, which includes now. Uh, people say it's a terrible idea and it will never happen. But I've always <laughs> not stopped. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, so even when working within an institution, I think the surprise uh, was that I don't take, uh, that I'm not going to stop. If I believe something is right, then I have to do it. And that's the reason I took the position was actually to give a platform to others, to advocate for others. This was finally an opportunity to present others, to give them the space. And there's no way, I mean, there's no reason for me to be at an institution if that's not something that I can push for. I understand that um, institutions are kind of like what I imagine like large cruise ships are like, and and like it takes them a really long term time to turn. Mm-hmm. And that's what I s- always saw as the advantage of our co-collaborative, right? Because we're tiny. <laughs> so being ahead of the curve or or moving forward or making a turn is not as difficult. Or that's what I think. Or that's what I believed. That's what I believed. Um, and And I guess what I'll say is that's what I still believe. Um, now. Yeah. I want to ask you about, um, the strategy surrounding the commissions initiated by Arco collaborative. You know, I've, I spend most of, of my time working with composers, working in composer advancement. And I know just as I'm sure, you know, that there are far more living composers than can be platformed on any given program, any even any given festival. There's so much music out there, which, again, as I mentioned earlier, is a 
a, a big part of my thinking around leaving the so-called canon behind, because even if we only focus on living artists, living composers, there will still be more than we can engage in in our lifetimes. But with, with that being said, I wonder um, if uh, you or if Arco Collaborative had a strategy around these uh, commissions. Is there a specific idea that you want audiences to take away when they uh, engage these performances? How did you uh, and, and uh, Arco Collaborative make these selections? Choosing the best artists that are out there mm. um, and the most interesting artists, the most imaginative ones, the most original ones, the stories and sounds I haven't heard before. That's how the choices are made. And it's true. It's um, it's artist led. I think, um, so for me, it's also become really important um, to mentor the next generation and to be able to create those opportunities and to change the language and the kind of ingrained messaging, I think, that there is. Um, a, around whose voices are important um, and whose voices are valued. And I, I mean, honestly, even like, or very recently, um, when questions of whether institutions will commission certain things or whether ARCO will, I remember the question was raised to me, well, can you guarantee that every single composition is going to be great? And I said, of course not. I bet looking at the history of this institution, 99% of what was commissioned was not great. 99% <laughs> of what exists, I, you know, uh, I might get the percentage wrong, but what I can say is no institution, no person, no artist can guarantee that this is going to be a masterpiece. But the important thing is you create an environment in which they can exist, in which we can see that they do exist, that there is representation. Um, and most importantly, that you give them space to experiment. I mean, the artists that I admire the most are like, Oftentimes the ones that are like 80 and they're still taking risks. There's like a kind of drive and a perfectionism and that just doesn't stop. And that's what, what I admire. Um, so yeah, I think, and also I think what's important kind of in a more general sense is that I think what's been ingrained in people is, I don't even know if this is totally hundred percent true, but anyhow, the language that I've often heard is, Oh my God, I hate new music. I like listened to this piece and I couldn't stand it. And I was like, uh, we don't think that if we go to a movie and it was a bad movie, I don't usually think I hate all movies. Exactly. <laughs> been made after like 1950 they i went to a movie once that was mm -hmm. made 20 years ago and i just i can't i hate i hate all movies that are made now um i don't see that with novels i don't see that um with writing necessarily i don't see that almost in any other art form um i mean maybe there is I mean, it's hard to, also, I live in a very specific area, um, metropolitan area. So, but I still do, I still did come from a very rural town. And I can say that people still saw movies that were made in that year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, that's how, so um, I also believe that it's important to kind of share a cornucopia, especially when we're we're working, especially when we're working within funding from an in, like an organization. I'm not going to call Arco an institution uh, because I feel like there's got to 
I don't know, maybe five figures is enough for it to be an institution. But in any case, um, I, I do believe that what we can handle uh, at ARCO is to present numerous opportunities to numerous composers and numerous voices for audiences to also realize that actually all new music is not like one thing. Right. Um, and honestly, I think, you know, I think in terms of the world, it's like good musicians, great musicians, mediocre musicians and bad musicians. Right. It's, it doesn't matter like this genre creation, I feel like was made in, in terms for money and things like ASCAP and um, things like, yeah, how do you sell this thing uh, to audiences? Um, yeah. Uh, so I just, you know, what my mission is, is to commission and support and advocate for the most interesting and best artists. Um, there are still so, I feel like the one thing I wish I could do was to to have the time to listen to even more and to go to even more venues to check out. And that's the one thing I think with being a smaller institution and by what I mean by smaller institution, I mean that, that like I write thank you notes in by hand. That's mm -hmm. what I mean by like, I, I shouldn't even call it, I feel like, can I call it an institution? Um, but please do support us if there's funding. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, of course. <laughs> no, no, no. But I guess what I'm saying is that it, it would be great if it was more than just me. Mm. Um, so of course I can't find every single person. Um, and what I would love to do is to find every single person and to find people I trust, to find, you know, to check out every single venue. Um uh so that that feels like my that's the thing that I feel limited by. Uh, it's just work and time. Yeah, sounds of us is definitely more than just Jenny Co. More than just any uh, specific uh, artist. Uh, I wonder who are some of the artists or composers uh, that you're most excited about collaborating with in conjunction with this work. Um, so there are 48 premieres uh, plus a surprise. Uh, which hopefully I can talk about later. Um, so 48 world premiere, musical world premieres. And um, so thinking about mentorship and my own experience and what was most kind of um, valuable to me was being able to work with uh, musicians I admired and older musicians in the field and where I learned so much by actually working with them side by side. So even if it's an observation, what time did they get to the hall before the concert? How, what kind of language? Like all sorts of things, like every aspect of performing that most of the time we don't even think about. Um, when do you travel to a venue? When do you travel to a city to play a concert? Like those were things I didn't know, at least for me, those were things I didn't know at all. Um, so, I'm having kind of professional musicians side by side with student musicians um, and quote unquote professional senior composers who recommended younger composers, which, um, you know, it was so amazing to me, actually. I felt so lucky um, that I got to meet 20 new amazing composers when I did Alone Together. And it was so wonderful, actually, to. Um, also like meet their music and meet their voices and meet their stories that I was like, got to do this all the time. <laughs> so um, they're also commissioning uh, where, or Arco is also commissioning uh, the younger composers that the kind of senior composers have recommended um, like well-known names, I guess, if we use that is um, Carlos Simon, Vijay Iyer, Inti, uh, Figus Visueta. Uh, I don't want to like leave people out. Uh, sure, Ian, sure. Chang, Ian Chang, Rafiq Bhatia, um, Anthony Chung, uh, uh, Linda Mayo. I'm like literally trying to think through all of the programs, Linda Mayo. Uh, 
Trevor, uh, oh, um, performers, uh, Weston Sprott, uh, Javier Gandera. Oh, I'm not going to, let's not list. I can't remember everybody. Oh God, this is terrible. I apologize to everyone. Nope. And and I'll, I'll be sure to link the uh, <laughs> the information about Sounds of Us so people can check out everyone who's uh, involved. But yeah, I was, was just curious about- I'm just mentioning yeah. the people that I literally spoke to in the last week because my memory doesn't go further. So <laughs> that's no probably word. because people have been so responsible that they've turned in their scores and there's been no like issues with anything. So I'm, I've, I'm mentioning the people that I've literally spoken to in the last seven days. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's really great for me to um, hear names that are very, very uh, familiar. I'll be chatting uh, with NT in a, in a couple of weeks, actually uh, folks like oh, Simon have uh, played a huge role in the work that I, I do with American composers orchestra. Also uh, love to hear names that I don't know, because again, as we've been repeating, there's so much music out there. There's so much artistry out there. Um, and, so much of it deserves uh, a platform, certainly more of a platform than it's uh, received in the past. I wanted to um, ask you one more question, maybe um, to just uh, on the on the broader front. You know, I've, I've interviewed many artists who believe that the so-called canon just needs to be updated. We need to create a new canon. But then there are others who believe that there shouldn't be a canon. You know, I think this is to say that the way, um, let's say, orchestra still, still center Beethoven, we should be wary of making the mistake of creating new Beethovens, new living composers who get all of the limelight or a disproportionate amount of the limelight, which in turn just creates a new version of the same problem that we've always been trying to traverse. I wonder, you know, what with those with those ideas in mind, what does an equitable classical or so-called classical ecosystem look like for you as you think about experimentation, commissioning, and really expanding the genre for the future? I mean, I think equity is not going to happen until we only have uh, people of color and women for the next 300 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I usually use use the quote of actually Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where somebody had asked her for the Supreme Court justices, when will it be enough women? Um, and I believe that's, that's the, um, something similar to that. Um, so the thing that's interesting to me about music is that even as a performer, like the whole reason we practice, or I hope that the whole reason we practice is not for ourselves to be the center of the stage in a lot of ways. Um, but actually 99, it's in order to leave 99.9% .9 of your brain um, open to listening to and responding to the people around you. Um, and that includes the audience as well. Um, and feeling how everybody is breathing in the room. Uh, so I think that how we think about composers of the past is problematic in the sense that we forget that they were human beings. Um, we forget the context in which they existed. And one of the things that I found have been the most effective ways of communicating um, in to classical audiences, what, what are categorized and essentially packaged as what is classical music audiences is to get, give a point of safety um, while also introducing um, the value. And I don't want to use the beauty, the word beauty, because sometimes it's, it's about um, the importance of facing and listening to stories. Uh, that you might not have heard before that are difficult to hear because they're not your own story. They're, they might not be your own family story. They might not be your own family's history story. Um, but I find that that's an effective way uh, to be able to present new music also in venues um, that they deserve. And that comes with a balance in programming. I am also, you know, 
I try to invest a lot in the performers and and composers and artists and vo voices for the future because I believe that they will continue to fight for an equitable future. But to be able to begin that, to be able to give them space and a platform, I feel that in my generation, or at least right now, um, that things have to be pre presented in a certain way. Now, does that mean that I, that, well, I do believe that composers of color should be, and and female composers, non-binary, I do think they should be on every program. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about equity, it's very different from uh, what we might call equality, what we might call um, lip service. And so when we're saying, you know, canon, that might be a point of safety for somebody to enter the room and to begin to have the conversation at all. Um, but I, and then the other thing is I trust artists. I trust them to be able to find ways of connection. Um, I believe in artists and in music to communicate emotionally the experiences that are in fact very human, that are shared emotions, the experiences, the life experiences, um, what the works of music are based on might be different than the audience, you know, audience's perspective, but they're still human stories. Mm -hmm. As a person of color working in a field that is the history of um, a very specific gender and a very specific race, I do believe that I can understand <laughs> classical music. It's, you know, I don't want to even say in spite of my race and gender. Um, so I also want to give the same credit to audiences that if we give them the opportunity, uh, they will listen um, and they will hear. It doesn't mean everybody. Um, but I think there are, I think we should give audiences the credit um, that if we do tell these stories, that they will come to the hall and that they will, I don't even, that they will be moved by it. Um, that it does change our worldview, even if it's incremental. Um, I never imagined that I'd say these things, actually. Um, and I think, and I think that's the one thing uh, that has been something that I've learned from having been in the field, something that I've learned in order to be able to even exist within larger stages and within larger institutions was that in order to get the voice voices of others heard, um, of people of color, and to commission them to find the funding. It had to be presented and packaged in a certain way. Jenny featured there in a work called Her Latitude. I thought that might be an appropriate title to end things with, especially this week. That work was written by a composer named Wong Lu, who I've actually had the opportunity to support in some of the work that I do with the American Composers Orchestra. So not one, but two women to honor there. Shout out to Wong Lu and congrats on uh, her continued success. And a huge, huge thank you to Jennifer Ko for taking the time to chat with me. Please be sure to support her upcoming series at the Kennedy Center if you're able. Again, I'll have a link in the description with all of the information that you will need. 
Okay, so for this week's Triloquy, I'm going to read from the autobiography of Huey P. Newton. Uh, for those who don't immediately recognize his name, Huey was one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party over in the Bay Area of California. So uh, similar to much of the work of Malcolm X, history has shaded Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party in a way that isn't really accurate. Many people will refer to the Black Panthers as being violent and this, that, and the other. But having read his autobiography at this point, I'm convinced that most people are just repeating what they've heard about him instead of what they've actually read or researched or experienced from his work. When we think about the Head Start program uh, for students, you know, that's a product of the Black Panther Party, for example. So violence has nothing to do with it. Self-defense, maybe, but certainly not violence. Anyway, I think thought I would read uh, from his autobiography uh, this week as we think about how to move forward being the very divided country that we currently are. In this excerpt, Huey talks about how his anti-racism fit within a broader context of class solidarity and the challenges uh, he had with bridging communities across class toward his goal of liberation. Um at this point in the book, just to offer some more context, at this point in the book, he had been falsely accused of a crime, falsely accused of uh, killing a police officer when he indeed was the one shot. Anyway, please go back and, and read about that. But he's in jail right now, fals falsely accused of a, a crime. Um, and many visitors, many activists are coming to talk with him, uh, to support him, to dialogue with him. Uh, and one of them was the activist Kwame Ture, who at that time uh, was known as Stokely Carmine. Michael, that might be a more familiar name to you. Anyway, here's what Huey recalled from their visit. It says here, our visit lasted just long enough for us to disagree. Stokely began by telling me that it would take what it would take to get me out of jail. The only thing that would do it, he said, was armed rebellion culminating in a race war. I disagree with him. While I acknowledge the pervasiveness of racism, the larger problem should be seen in terms of class exploitation and the capitalist system. In analyzing what was happening in the country, I said that we would have to accept many alliances and form solidarity with any people fighting the common oppressor. He objected to the Black Panther Alliance with the Peace and Freedom Party, and he said we should not associate with white radicals or let them come to our meetings or be involved in our rallies. Stokely warned that whites would destroy the movement, alienate black people, and lessen our effectiveness in the community. Later, he proved right in terms of what happened to the party, although he was wrong in principle. As a result of coalitions, the Black Panthers were brought into the free speech movements, the psychedelic fad, and the advocacy of drugs, which we were and are dead set against. All of these causes were irrelevant to our work which was concerned with deeper and more fundamental issues, in fact, survival. When these things happened, Stokely warned whites would try to take the leadership from us. I'll, I'll, I'll just read that much. Uh, this book, his autobiography is called Revolutionary Suicide. It's a, a really incredible read, but I wanted to highlight that excerpt from the book because in my opinion, it's so important to take a look at the degree to which coalition across race um, and centering on class has been the uh, effort of so many people. You know, I believe that they assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. when he started speaking against capitalism. You know, Malcolm X is quoted as saying capitalism can't exist without racism. So while racism is certainly an issue that we're still dealing with here in the country and was certainly a key factor um, in Kamala Harris's defeat by Donald Trump, I think it's something that we just have to reconsider this idea of class solidarity. You know, I'm looking at people uh, sharing these voting charts, these exit polls showing that most white people, men and women, voted for Donald Trump. A huge, huge, huge portion of the um, Latinx, Latino, Latina community voted for Donald Trump. And this is being used as a tool to keep us separated. And I think that's by design. I think as long as there is a lack of class consciousness and class class solidarity, we will continue to be defeated by forces who pull the wool over so many people's faces and push us into a more and more fascist state by the day. Now, with that being said, I have to 
also look at history and, you know, consider as Huey P. Newton there what did actually happen to the Black Panther Party and the ways in which non-Black people sort of subverted the efforts. And I think that still happens today. You know, this idea of people of color or BIPOC, I hope that we're moving away from that when it comes to uh, black equity and indigenous equity, because, you know, we saw how people voted and uh, we, we also plainly see the degree to which Afro-Americans, you know, American descendants of enslaved, a- enslaved Africans are continually more and more marginalized within and among people of color due to this BIPOC framing. So it's, it's not a straight line. It's not a, a completely clean way of looking at things as much as it's, for me, an opportunity for us to consider the degree to which class solidarity will be our path forward. There is no united front among people of color. Um, I think only the exit polls I saw only about 7% of black women didn't vote for Kamala Harris. So, you know, they're pretty united. I think about 19% of black men decided to uh, vote for Donald Trump. So while that is disappointing, you know, there is much more of a united front there, but more than 50%, most white people, most white men and most most white women voted for Donald Trump. What is it that folks like me and folks like you can do to connect with those people? People who believe that their sovereignty, their bank account, something is is at risk. What 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 can we do to make those connections? And in my opinion, I think it's class solidarity. I feel like I've said that a few times here on the Truly We podcast and reading from Huey P. Newton has brought that uh, issue back up. So um, good luck to us all. Try to uh, develop a relationship with someone uh, in in your community, you know, your your next door neighbor, someone who lives in your building, if you're uh, in an apartment, your coworkers. Let's work toward a broader coalition of people, just as Huey P. Newton fought for, just as so many other people fought for, so that we can figure out how to move our country in a better direction. Good luck to us all. Goddess, bless America, I suppose. Maybe not. Daniel Bernard Remain said, God damn America. Maybe that's what we need to be thinking about in the creation of a new place that actually honors us all and protects us all. Um, yeah, that's all I got this time. I'll see y'all. Uh, I'll talk to y'all again soon. Be safe. Mm-hmm.